interviewing Sergey Brin on stage. Google hadn't yet become a public company, and people could see that it was rising. The search engines themselves were all incredibly secretive about how their algorithms worked, how their engines worked. That was probably my biggest holy shit moment. Back when it was okay to fill up your meta tags with 5,000 keywords. I, I pretty much disagree with everything he ever said about SEO. I don't know what he's talking about these days, but. And people felt like you just paid somebody and then they did some magic and then all of a sudden their website would rank by itself. Hi, I'm John Lincoln and welcome to SEO the Movie. So what attracted me to SEO, the early days of SEO, I mean, it, it was just a rock star type of industry. There's so many people and tools and software that deserve credit for the massive thought leadership and just dedication to innovation that's happened. Some of those people would be Danny Sullivan, incredibly funny, just a joy to read. Jill Whalen, who dedicated a large portion of her life to search. You've got Barry Schwartz, who is relentless in covering the news. You've got Rand Fishkin looking to innovate every single day. Brett Tabke over at PubCon. Ray Hoffman, one of the original affiliate marketers and an SEO veteran. So if you don't know, search engine optimization is basically getting content ranked inside of a search engine. And the reason you'd want to do that is to drive traffic revenue, leads, branding to your website. The early days of SEO, there were these affiliates who were making, you know, millions of dollars a year. You were young kids who had figured out ways to get ranked at the top of Google. Just seeing the type of money that these people were making off of their own individual knowledge, it was incredibly inspiring to me. That sort of time period in SEO had this odd quality to it. The search engines were making incredible amounts of money and they had this philosophy of breaking rules and moving fast. There was huge opportunity, especially for affiliate players, SEOs, and there was this sense of uh, unbridled opportunity. The parties back in the day in the industry, it was definitely epic. Yahoo had decided to throw a party, and for the party, they rented out the Hugh Hefner suite. The rental of the suite for the evening was $200,000. We were supposed to keep it professional, but there was a pool hanging out over the balcony over the strip. And it had this plexiglass bottom after drinking far too much went into. Um, I did not have a swimsuit. It is definitely something that I will never forget. That party in particular, sure, I think it in a lot of ways epitomizes uh, that era. Hi, I'm Danny Sullivan. I'm the founding editor of Search Engine Land. I got into covering search engines uh, over 20 years ago. I was a journalist. I saw the web starting to develop, and so I left from newspapers to do web development in 1995. We had SEO even then, even though we didn't really call it that, in the sense that people understood that there were these search engines, that it was important to be listed on them, but no one really understood how you do it or what was effective. So I started looking into it, published a guide that became the uh, Webmaster's Guide to Search Engines, and then eventually developed into the work that I do today. It set me off on a whole new career that I hadn't been expecting just because I really wanted to get some decent answers to questions about how search engines work. Danny Sullivan, he's clearly the oldest established name in SEO today. When I think back to the early days, Danny was always there with his, his weekly newsletter posts, uh, keeping us informed. Looking back at when I first met Danny Sullivan, kind of like the feeling like you meet Matt Cotts. It was, he was like literally the founder, the man behind the search industry, 
And when I met him, it was just, it was really a great honor. Obviously now I work with him every day and I speak to him all the time and it's not that much of a thrill anymore, so sorry Danny. But um, I've never met somebody who could understand and communicate a technical SEO topic as quickly and as comprehensively as he has. When I think of Danny Sullivan, I think of the Dan Rather of SEO. He is the original reporter on the industry. I think Danny uh, did a great job in the early days of kind of getting to the search engines and, and being that journalist that was like, hey, you know, I, I need to report on this, but I actually understand what I'm gonna be reporting on. You can tell if the mainstream media has reported on a topic or if Danny Sullivan has reported on a topic. Interviewing Sergey Brand on stage, back in the day and uh, Eric Schmidt as well was amazing, you know, especially with Sergey because Google hadn't yet become a public company and people could see that it was rising and it was you know, still very kind of raw and fresh. I can remember once being at Leica's when a big story broke about the size of search engines and watching them all panic because they were not one of the biggest search engines that were out there. It's like, how do we deal with that? I remember the same thing at a Google dance. Uh, Yahoo had announced they had a bigger index than Google. And, you know, all the people at Google suddenly went into crisis mode on how they deal with that. So witnessing those sorts of things certainly has been uh, great. Hi, I'm Rand Fishkin. I'm the founder of Moz. Uh, I started this company as a blog in 2004. I had been contributing on many different uh, forums and websites and decided I needed a place to call my own. Today, Moz is about $43 million in revenue, 155 people, almost 40,000 paying customers all over the world. Yeah, it's been an exciting journey getting into this field of SEO. My early career was actually in web design. And then I was doing a little bit of contracting for websites that basically were clients of my mom's when I was in college. And then of course, once we'd build a website, the client would always say, all right, now how do we get traffic? And the answer to that was SEO. And it was time for, you know, Rand to learn the practice of SEO himself. So I spent tons of time on, you know, the forums and, and the bulletin boards and the chat rooms. <laughs> and I had phone calls with people who knew SEO. I read voraciously. And eventually, after a lot of stumbling, found my way. In 2005, I was deeply in debt. Moz was deeply, deeply in debt. You know, my mom and I had close to $150,000 of credit card debt that we had defaulted on, which meant that we owed credit card companies something like half a million dollars. We couldn't declare bankruptcy because if we did, the banks might take my parents' house and my grandmother's house and um, you know, all the money that my dad had saved over a, a career, you know, lifetime career at Boeing. And uh, there's all sorts of complexity around it too. Like my mom and I never told my dad that we had debt. So, I mean, yeah, my mom was like, you know, she'd be driving home trying to get to the mailbox before my dad to make sure that if there was like credit notices, this was like a can't sleep at night kind of stress, just awful. And I'd been contributing to the search engine watch forums for you know, a number of years at that point. I remember asking if I should go to New York for the SES conference and Danny private messaged me over the, uh, the forums and said, um, Rand, I'll, I'll get you in for free. I'll, I'll give you a pair of tickets. And that conference, we signed our first big, you know, like really big client, multi, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month type of client. I met, you know, many of my SEO heroes there. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember seeing Danny there and shaking his hand and just having this experience of being overwhelmed with gratitude. And that, uh, that, is, that is a gesture I'll, I'll never forget. I think Rand is such a smart, clever and curious person that he, he really embodies a lot of the qualities that, that you want to be a successful SEO. This really is someone who says, why is it working that way? I'm going to poke it at this way, I'm going to poke it at that way, and I'm going to try to understand you know, how to ferret out the important things that 
uh, you can use to be more successful with. He, before he was famous or anyone knew of him, you know, he would post on our forum sometimes asking questions. And, you know, he's one of those ones that would 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 email me questions at times. Um, so it, it was funny. It was it was kind of cool to see how, you know, he grew and, you know, grew his company. This was 2006. I was invited to Benchmark Capital's annual gathering and one of the topics that was of great interest was SEO. And they asked me to come speak at this conference. And so I remember looking at the, uh, the speaker list. It was uh, folks like, you know, Nira Tolia, the founder of Nextdoor, Meg Whitman, who at the time was the CEO of eBay, just these, these luminaries, uh, uh, Jeremy Stoppelman from Yelp, Spencer Raskoff, Rich Barton from Zillow and, and Expedia, right, were there. And it was, it was just crazy. I mean, I looked down the list and I sort of had this, wow, these are all the people who Wired Magazine writes about every month. And who the hell is this Rand Fishkin guy? What am I doing here? A photo of my mom and I were on the cover of Newsweek. It was one of the first kind of big mainstream publications that wrote about SEO. And they had me wear sunglasses and stand in a park. It was kind of ridiculous. Uh, the next day I was extremely nervous, but I got up on stage, I probably stuttered a little bit at first, and then I gave a decent talk, a halfway decent talk, and you know, in the next six months we had people like Zillow and Yelp and Etsy and eBay as clients of Moz, so it really, it was very transformational. I'm Jill Whalen and I'm a former SEO consultant. My website was highrankings.com back in the day. I started doing SEO back in 95, even before 95. I was just basically a mom at home and I started a parenting website. There weren't very many of them back then kind of wanted to figure out how to get it found in the search engines of the day. You know, Lycos and Excite and Webcrawler. I would do some searches and then look at what sites came up and figure out why they came up. It really became clear to me then, it was the words on the page that really made the difference for which site showed up. I started, you know, put certain words on my page like parenting chat and things like that and the website started showing up. I was getting 400 visitors a day to that site back when like nobody hardly was online. I think one of the things that Jill did so well is build up this community of very generous contributors. You know it was just people helping each other because they cared about each other. Jill Whalen was one of the pioneers of SEO and in particular I think one of the important things she did was the focus on content. Getting to speak at conferences was amazing and traveling all over the world. The second conference I went to was actually in Amsterdam that Danny Sullivan couldn't go for some reason. He was supposed to be speaking there and so he recommended me and I had literally never really spoken <laughs> before in public. We didn't even have PowerPoint. I just like uh, just had this like word document that my things went up on the screen it looked really pathetic and I was so scared and so nervous Heather had to like hold me down I was like ready to run out of the place I'm Brett Tabke I run PubCon internet marketing conferences for that I owned Webmaster World my first computer was a Commodore 64 when I was a freshman in college I started bulletin board systems, so I started running communities. And then in the 90s, I left a major computer manufacturer. I started building websites. From there, it was just a natural progression into SEO, and we needed a place to talk about this. So I started Webmaster World. So back in the day, there was a lot of just easy technical stuff. Nobody knew how to build web pages, let alone how to get traffic or how to get listed. On Webmaster World, we had people that attempted to sue us over someone using keywords in a post. We would often have threads that would rank higher for a product name 
than the product's home page because we had such high PR. We had a PR9 for several years on Webmaster World. We would rank higher for a thread about a product than the actual product page would, and they would attempt to sue us. They would call our web hosting provider. We got DDoSed many a times. They would uh, complain to Google. The search engines themselves, you know, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, were all incredibly secretive about how their algorithms worked, how their engines worked. I think that they felt it was, you know, this was sort of a proprietary trade secret that helped them maintain a competitive advantage against one another. As a result, as a practitioner, trying to keep up with the search engines, understand what they were doing, uh, being able to distinguish real information about SEO from, you know, fake information was incredibly challenging. In the early days, we had basically two camps. We had an SEO camp. They wanted to play the Google game. They wanted to play what Google wanted to do. They wanted to play what also Vista wanted to do. And then we had another set that was affiliate based. They were all about getting leads, about generating churn and burn traffic. It was always antagonistic between the SEOs and the affiliates. It almost still is. Well, the affiliates, they just didn't care about Google rules. It didn't matter. They would load up a thousand domains with a thousand keywords and a thousand link text, and they'd do it all from a script from uh, the comfort of their, their bedroom. A good friend, Todd Friesen, called it spamming and jamming and started keyword stuffing on the black hat side. That sort of stuff always turned me off. It felt to me like it was a short-term potential win that would never help in the long term. And my philosophy around marketing and around building companies has always been to get that flywheel going. And Black Hat for me just didn't help that flywheel move. You can almost say that the affiliates were the original Black Hatters and the SEOs were original White Hatters almost. And the early days of PubCon, in fact, we, we would have PubCon and then we often joke we had LobbyCon where there would be a group of affiliates out in, in the lobby holding a small conference unto themselves, literally holding sessions, sessions in the lobby uh, or in the bar again um, while, while the real conference was going on in, in the hotel rooms, in the, in the conference rooms. Brett Tapke is an incredible pioneer. The number of people who benefited from the work he did in creating and managing and growing Webmaster World and later on PubCon was incredible. There was a time when I, along with so many people, would be on Webmaster World every day because it really was the place to be, especially when you would have people like Google Guy, who later, of course, was, was Matt Cutts owned up to being, would be giving out that kind of advice. It was an important place for people to then interact and get that kind of real-time information about stuff that was breaking. He and his team at Webmaster World has named most of the Google updates, starting back with the Florida update or even before that, Big Daddy. I could just go through hundreds of updates that Brett Tapke and his team at Webmaster World has named over the course of the years. And honestly, without Brett Tapke, a lot of these updates would not have the names that they have. A lot of them would not have been found. Without Webmaster World and Brett Tapke, you would not have known about many of these Google updates because that's where all the discussion or most of the discussion around these Google updates have had. There's so many people who have played a role in building search engine optimization into the huge industry that it is today. People like John Mueller, people like Miley Ole, Alita Solis, Cindy Crum, Bruce Clay, Will Reynolds, Michael King, Brian Dean, Lauren Baker, Eric Ward, Cyrus Shepard, Bill Slosky, Chris Sherman, Jim Boykin, Sean Hogan, Mike Graham, Eric Inge, Gary Grant. My name is Ray Hoffman. Um, I also go in the industry by Sugar Ray, my alter ego. When I think back to the early days, the biggest life-changing moment for me, I was working in the long distance space I had, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars coming in a month from ranking for long distance terms. And a buddy of mine contacts me and he says, hey, I'm doing really well with this product. It's this diet pill called Phenermine. I had never heard of Phenermine before. I had to go look it up. So I built the website and back then Google updated once every, you know, five to eight weeks and whatever rankings you had, once it was done, you know, doing what we called the dance, those were your rankings for the next five to eight weeks until it danced again. So if you lost your rankings, you were screwed. If you gained your rankings, you had solid income coming in.
I wake up one morning and my MSN windows are all lit up, which means there had to have been an update while I was sleeping. So I go to open my email and it is flooded. You've made a sale, you've made a sale, you've made a sale, and I could not figure out. So I start checking all these like really long tail terms for Phenermine because that was the, the product that I was getting the sale notifications for. And it turned out that I ended up taking number three for Phenermine as a single word, number one for buy Phenermine, um, and number one for Phenermine online. My first commission check for the first month of those rankings was more than my then husband made in a year. That was probably my biggest holy shit moment. So Ray and I have been, uh, you know, friends for, for many years through the industry again. Uh, I think she initially recognized that I was someone who had a lot of naivete, particularly around the gray hat and black hat world and sort of took me under her wing on a lot of those topics. I know Rain Hoffman also, she goes way back, probably to the 90s of SEO. And Ray is always the person that always makes you think about doubting Google. When Google says something, are they really communicating the whole truth? Are they trying to get you to do something just because it makes it, their job easier? Is that a bad thing or not? Ray is one of those people that kind of reminds you of somebody who's come from the black hat space, but also really cares about producing a really quality website and producing really quality content. Back in the day, SEO was basically, in a lot of ways, spamming Google, black hat SEO. They, they didn't necessarily want you to do that. You know, people were keyword stuff and people were buying links. And, and that's all they used to have to do because there was such a small percentage of the population that understood what, what SEO even was. I mean, I'm talking one, two percent. And so these people were just making a killing. Hi, I'm Barry Schwartz. I am the news editor at Search Engine Land, the founder of the Search Engine Roundtable blog and the president of a web development company in New York named Rusty Brick. Before the SEO world, it was pretty much about building websites, putting a uh, www.domain.org or .com on your business card and hoping people found you that way because people didn't really know about search. And people thought like you just paid somebody and then they did some magic and then all of a sudden their website would rank by itself. And even today I get phone calls um, from people saying, you know, could you go ahead and rank my website number one for this keyword? And one is I don't offer SEO services, but two is it doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of time. Just like when you want to build a brand, it takes time to earn a reputation. In terms of like conferences and stuff, I was very, very proud to bring the XMX Search Marketing Expo brand to Israel. I pretty much run that whole event totally by myself from the Third Door Media team. But I run it every year or so in Jerusalem, my move to Tel Aviv, and it's a really pretty impressive event. We usually sell out of 500 attendees, we have close to 50 or so speakers across the world come in, and I'm very happy to be able to be in a place where I can actually bring the XMX event to Israel. What can I say about Barry? Does that guy ever sleep? He puts out tons of articles. If Google burps, Barry knows. The guy is tireless and he is an absolute SEO news beast. He would ferret out little bits of information everywhere on the web, uh, whether it would be at Webmaster World in the early days or Google forums, wherever it was, Barry would find it. He, he's the ultimate news hound. I think, think the world of his journalistic skills. And when you always get that rush from breaking a news story and having a major news publication cover it. I remember being called in by NBC, Brian Williams. He actually uh, asked to interview me about a story around Google Instant. I was one of the first people to find Google testing Google Instant, and Google was about to announce it um, a week or so later. So they called me into NBC Universal to go ahead and uh, interview on that topic. It's not just the people in the industry, it's also these companies that are dedicated to innovation and, and pushing the level. Of course, you think about SEM Rush, you think about Moz, you think about advanced web rankings, Raven Tools, Bright Edge, Conductor, Spy Fu, Rio SEO, Search Metrics, Authority Labs, AREFs. The list really goes on. Majestic. That there's so many different companies and tools and services around this industry that have made major, major contributions. 
Matt Cutts. Matt Cutts. Matt Cutts. Talking Tech today with Matt Cutts. Have you ever wondered, how do I get my website so people will find it? Matt Cutts was one of the first 100 employees at Google. In an industry, he's about as legendary as you could be. He's so much history and uh, so many things that people still reference today that he said because you know he was really the only window between Google and um, the search engine community. And the thing that was really special about Matt was Matt did not, he wasn't somebody that was telephoning down the lane. He wasn't somebody that was a go-between. Matt was a direct link to the web spam team at Google. So when we asked Matt how something worked, Matt often knew the answer himself because he had either built it, overseen it being built, or understood why it was built. Larry and Sergey were fairly antagonistic to SEOs and the way I understood it, Matt went into Larry and said, we need to do this. We need to have an outreach program for webmasters. Matt did that. He started coming around Webmaster World, posting his Google guy. He really reached out to us and, and laid out the welcome mat. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. Hi, everybody. Matt Cutts here. I wanted to tell you about a neat feature of Google Webmaster Tools that you Okay, so that's basically just like, tell me everything about Google, right? There was that period there where, because Google was sucking so bad that websites weren't showing. So I remember tweeting something to Matt Cutts. If only Matt Cutts would get off his ass and fix Google, we'd, you know, we'd, uh, things would be a lot better. And, and I wrote a couple of articles about Google sucking all the way to the bank because I really believed that they were purposely not being so great so that people would have to buy ads from them. But the interesting thing was it wasn't long after that when suddenly they fixed everything. I and Moz had many challenges with Matt Cuts over the years. Uh, we at first had a very friendly, um, professional and personal relationship uh, for several years. And then I think Matt took the view that some of the transparency that I espoused and that we were putting out there on Moz uh, really bothered him and bothered Google. And occasionally I get an email from him saying, I wish you wouldn't write about this. I wish you wouldn't invite this person to your conference. I wish, um, well, <laughs> and sometimes stronger than that, like, uh, you need to remove this thing from your tool or we will ban you. <laughs> uh, and that, that bothered me a lot, right? I always felt like Google held us, that's not fair. I always felt like Matt himself held us to a higher standard or different standard than he held many other folks in the SEO industry. And you know, maybe now as more of a grown up reflecting on that, I probably should have taken some pride and been more honored by that rather than this reactive uh, anger that I had and this feeling of being treated badly. I think one of the biggest changes that the SEO industry saw in recent years was actually the loss of Matt Cutts, uh, Matt retiring. I don't think we would be the industry we are today without Matt Cutts. Uh, I think the world of him personally and professionally. When these Google algorithms came out, Penguin, Panda, Sandbox, all these algorithms, there was really one person at Google that they really blamed and that was Matt Cutts. He was the one who was the direct face of these algorithm updates. There's a thing called the Google Dance. It took its name from something that happened with how Google used to update its algorithm. And when the changes would flow out, and there was either a new algorithm or new data that was pushed into uh, the Google search engine, the results would kind of dance around for a day or two or three. And okay, things are happening. I don't know what's going on with my website. Let's see how it all settles out. And people would hold their breath and, and watch what would happen. And some of these uh, updates would be significant enough that they earned their own names. The names often at the time would come from Webmaster World where people would discuss them and oftentimes would be correlated to where Webmaster World was going to have an event. You wouldn't think the launch of the Google Toolbar would be such an important, huge chapter in SEO, but it really was. And in particular, it was because the Google Toolbar came with an advanced feature called the PageRank Meter. And suddenly, people could discover how important Google deemed their sites and particular pages based on 
the, the links pointing at them, that everybody had a PageRank score. And if everybody could have a PageRank score, then we could buy and sell links based on PageRank scores. And that's exactly what happened. And it is a woe that has continued to play Google and the SEO space to this day. It's involved lawsuits over Google then taking page rank away from people. It's involved lawsuits that have said Google has a First Amendment right to do that. While the toolbar itself wasn't an update, uh, it wasn't a change to the algorithm, it had a huge wide ranging impacts on, on the whole search space uh, that continued to reverberate through today. It happened sometime around 2003. Google released this algorithm that went ahead and looked for various techniques that SEOs were using to kind of manipulate the search results. It was a big change that Google made where they were trying to filter out poor quality content and improve the quality of their search results. And it went ahead and impacted so many websites from ranking where they were to completely destroying their rankings. A lot of these people have gotten used to Google providing them with dependable traffic assume that, that it's been that way and it would always be that way and really kind of went into free fall. Oh my God, I have zero sales. I have a staff of 100 employees sitting in my warehouse, not able to fulfill orders. My business is gonna go bust. And that's what happened with many, many retailers. Florida update was one of the major Google updates that Google did not confirm ever. Google really came out and put their foot down with the Florida update. They, they, they really threw an elbow and let us know that this was their algorithm, this was their machine that they, and their business that they were going to protect. Um, they clearly went out and went directly after search engine uh, optimizers. Google referenced the Inktomi spam database during the Florida update in several, several talks that, you know, it was the prototype. They went out and they went after SEOs. They went after SEO clients that were uh, breaking the, the terms of service of Google. Google really let us know that uh, the days that we used to know were over, that they were taking control of their search engine going forward. You can just remember how much being on Webmaster World at that time was, was crucial if you were trying to understand everything that was going on. And it owes so much of a debt back to, to Brett as being a, a leader in the industry and, and just creating that kind of a place. People had come to understand that Google was very dependent on links. And so you wanted to get links to your website. And that then, of course, as always seemed to be the case, produced a lot of junk and a lot of spam along the way. Leading up to the introduction of the nofollow tag, there had been cries that Google was to blame for all of this blog spamming that was going on, these automated tools that would just come through and drop links on all sorts of blogs. And you had prominent people in the blogging space demanding that Google somehow fix it. And so Google finally did, or at least they fixed their PR problem, they didn't solve the blog spam problem. Uh, they introduced what was called the nofollow attribute, or the nofollow tag, and it allowed you to say, yes, this link from my website should not carry credit from my website to other websites. And the idea was that if you use this for your blog links, then people wouldn't spam you anymore because it was just going to be a waste of time. So the Google Panda update came out sometime in 2011. I think it was February 2011. And it was one of the most famous Google updates to ever happen. For all those of you who have been sort of manipulating Google by using a powerful website, a powerful website in terms of influential through authority and through links, and simply creating massive amounts of content on it, we, Google, are going to reduce the impact that those have. And in fact, we're going to change our, our paradigm around how we penalize. We're not just going to penalize the things, the pages that didn't perform. We're going to penalize an entire site for even what you know this one section of the site is doing. It impacted about 12% of the search queries, meaning 12% of the rankings in Google have changed drastically because of it, and that was a major change. 12% of your search rankings, pretty big change. Yeah, I, I thought it was actually a, a very smart move on Google's part. We had a dramatic uplift. There were a lot of uh, sites in the SEO field that we didn't have to compete with anymore. These Google updates, they can have massive, massive impacts if you're doing these things that are against Google's guidelines, like creating thin content, which was what Panda targeted, or creating backlinks and using blog networks and having too much anchor text, which is what Penguin targeted. The Penguin update. It targeted specifically link spam. Sites that were going ahead and using the link graph 
within Google as a way to manipulate the search results. And Google was aware of this and they had to go ahead and com combat SEOs and webmasters just buying links, selling links, and trying to manipulate the search results based off of link manipulation. And that hit a lot of SEOs. I think more SEOs were complaining about the Penguin update than the Panda update because the Panda update was more focused around content and you had publishers that were hit by that, but SEOs specifically focused a lot around links. And SEOs that did a lot of link development noticed that their clients and all of them pretty much were hit hard by this Penguin update. And the forums went crazy. Whenever a Penguin update hits, and there were a lot of them, um, you always see the, the SEO forums, more so the black, black hat SEO forums go crazy, saying there's, a pan, there's some Penguin update happening, my rankings have dropped, and so forth. And when you got hit by a Penguin update, you weren't able to get out of that Penguin update there are a lot of complaints that I could make about the Penguin algorithm, but I think the most important complaint is how long they waited between updates. As a consultant, I had companies calling me that were hit by Penguin, had since cleaned up all of their backlinks. In some cases, they did them. In other cases, they hired crappy SEOs and had no idea what they were doing. But either way, they cleaned up the mess and they would contact me and they would say, well, we're, we're still not unpenalized, so we, we need you to look at it to see you know, what we missed. And I'd tell them, well, you didn't miss anything. You have to wait for Google to push the button again. And Google waited almost two years to push that button again. I would get calls from companies that told me that they had two months before they were gonna have to close the doors and start firing employees. And they were waiting on a Penguin update. And Google launched something that was extremely, extremely punitive, that was extremely devastating, that threw a lot of baby out with the bathwater and then chose not to update it again for almost two years. I hate making predictions about where we're gonna be in five years or 10 years. I will tell you how I feel right now, today, you know, Q1 of 2017, which is, but if you had asked me 10 years ago, where are we gonna be in 10 years? Never would I have been able to remotely fathom the development of Twitter or the development of Facebook or that YouTube would become one of the largest search engines on the internet. SEO has a very bright future for at least the next three or four years. I think the future after that is more uncertain. And the biggest risk that I see to this field is that search volume and the possibility of being in front of searchers diminishes dramatically because of smart assistance and voice search. I don't know, in some ways I think it is sort of dead now, at least as a, as a standalone industry. I will say the future of search is super bright and people are going to evolve with it. So the future SEO to me is this entire holistic approach. SEO, mobile, the web, social, every place you can put marketing is gonna count. We can't just do on the page stuff anymore. We can't worry about links 24 seven. I think it's never too late for people to get started with SEO. It's not like if you haven't been doing it since 1996. It's over and done. You're in an industry that likes to reshape itself to some degree every six months to 12 months. Searching is always going to be tied to research. And whenever anybody needs a service or a product, they're gonna do research. It might be through Facebook, it might be through Twitter, it might be through LinkedIn, it might be through YouTube, right? There's a lot of different search engines out there and platforms that are always expanding and contracting based off of the features that they're putting out there. I think there always will be a need for SEOs. The SEO description has changed a lot over the course of the years, but the primary purpose of SEO is to make sure and to help searchers find your website. Creating awesome content that's easy to find, that's technically set up correctly, and that reverberates through the internet and sends signals to other people that you should digest it. And that's the core of what search is about. I think the future of search is, um, is going to be just fine.
We're going to do a movie about SEO. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do a whole movie about search engine optimization. And we're not even going to invite Link Moses himself, the guy who did the original campaign for link building and SEO for Amazon.com on a 14-4 modem from his kitchen table. Yeah, we're going to do our fancy SEO movie and not even ask Eric Ward to be in it. I cannot believe those SOBs. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to link spam this their website. I'm going to I'm going to make it so nobody sees this movie.